guys, welcome to Unapologetic Live. I'm your host, Amala Efanobi, and Spencer is back today. I'm back one more time. <laughs> Not in the chat today. Guys, welcome. Happy Friday. I hope you guys are so excited that it's Friday and you guys get your beautiful weekend ahead of you. Let me know in the comments down below what your plans are for the weekend. I am doing a girl's day with my roommate tomorrow. We're going to the gun range. We're going shopping. We're going to go get lunch. We're going to do all this type of fun stuff. So drop it down in the comments down below. What are you doing this weekend? Let me know. Uh, today, we're going to do our week in review where we go through and talk about all the trending stories and videos and reactions that we have this week. Uh, and there's plenty to talk about as there is every single week. The first thing I want to talk about is something that I just did a short on. It's on the channel if you guys want to check it out. But... Uh, a man by the name of Charles Booker, who's running for the U.S. Senate in Kentucky, came out with a campaign ad to talk about uh, what he plans to do with his run and talk about his opponent. Here's the tweet that he put out. Lynching is a tool of terror. It's used to kill hopes for freedom. In Kentucky, it was used to kill three of my uncles. In this historic election, the choice is clear. Rand Paul wants to divide us, uh, but won't uh, win this time. It's time to move forward together. Now, when you hear that, you go, lynching? Why the hell are we talking about lynching uh, in today's day and age where that's not happening and really is a non-issue, especially if we're going to use it to talk about systemic racism against black people? Well, Charles Booker here is going to tell you exactly why we're talking about that. Here is his video. The pain of our past persists to this day. In Kentucky, like many states throughout the South, lynching was a tool of terror. It was used to kill hopes for freedom. It was used to kill my ancestors. Now... Dude, what? <laughs> Let me pause for a second. This is giving me mad Jesse Smollett vibes. He's putting on his own noose for this ad campaign that he's doing right now. Let's let's separate and put the disclaimer out there. Lynching is a horrible thing. It's such a wonder that I have to say something like that. It is a horrible thing, and it is a transgression that was committed in the racist past of this country. Is it happening now? No, it's not. Is it a systemic problem now? No, it's not. So why would somebody bring this up in order to justify their cause? Let's find out. In a historic victory for our Commonwealth, I have become the first black Kentuckian to receive the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senate. My opponent, the very person who compared expanded health care to slavery, the oh, person who said gosh. he would have opposed the Civil Rights Act, the person who single-handedly blocked an anti-lynching act from being federal law. The choice couldn't be clearer. Do we move forward together? Or do we let politicians like Rand Paul forever hold us back and drive us apart? In uh, November, holding back and driving apart is exactly what you're doing right now. There is nothing like holding people back into a historic time period that we are no longer in. That's what's holding people back. Telling people of color that not only have we not progressed as a society, but you still run the risk of having this happen to you in today's nation. It's unbelievable. And a question here. After that anti-lynching act was shot down by the man that he referenced, how many lynchings occurred after that? Can anybody answer that? Did we suddenly have an uptick in people being lynched in the street? No, we didn't. So a lot of this is simply to virtue signal, to make you feel bad and worse than anything, to exploit people's emotions about a subject matter that is horrifying. So lynching, horrible thing. Jim Crow laws, horrible thing. Slavery, horrible, horrible thing. Is it happening now though? Have we progressed as a society? Have we decided that those transgressions are wrong and that we don't want to commit them again? Yes, it's not happening. So why are we still leaning on those things to justify the actions that we do currently? That's my question. I'm totally all for talking about history, teaching people about these horrible, regressive, and horrific acts that were committed against others. But is it happening today is the question. And no, it's not. And if he's going to talk about systemic racism, I would love to hear an example of systemic racism happening today against people of color. I would love to hear it. Can somebody, if anybody can think of something, put it in the comments and let me know what form of systemic racism against people of color is happening right now. 
We can talk about things like affirmative action and progressive policy. That can be systemically racist in many, in more ways than one. But actual targeted discrimination against people that says because of your skin color, you are less than. Can anybody give me an example? You can't. And it's a wonder to me that somebody would try to run with this narrative rather than talking about actual issues that we are facing as a society. Instead, you want to fearmonger people into uh, supporting your side of the aisle by making up what is a fictitious reality. It's no longer happening. And you hold people back in doing that. You know what would have been beautiful? What would have been beautiful is an ad saying, this is part of our past or whatever, even if you, you don't even need to talk about it, but if you were gonna talk about that and you wanted that to be part of your ad and go, and now we live in the United States of America where I can do whatever it is that I wanna do and now I'm running for this seat. Wouldn't that be amazingly beautiful to go look at these horrific things that happened in the past and look at how we came together as a nation to unite and prosper against these things, to pull ourselves out of the hole that is systemic racism, to work together to actually promote unity. And now you see a man like this who's running for US Senate, not that his skin color matters, but that would have been far more beautiful than saying, I, uh, my ancestors were the victims of lynching and it's this sentiment is still occurring today and that's my opponent and let's demonize an entire group of people who have a different set of values than I do and call them racist. That's essentially what's happening here. Her horrible ad. And you have to think about who greenlit this? <laughs> because as I can imagine, it, when you're running for election, you sit at a, a table of people and you go, okay guys, here's the ad concept that I got. You'd think maybe even, maybe even before they made it, they would have been like, uh, here's my idea for an ad. I think you should put a noose around your neck, talk about lynching, say that that sentiment is still here in America and then blame the person you're running against. I think that would be awesome. And instead of the table cheering and going, yeah, let's run with that, let's go buy the piece of rope, they should have said, that's a horrific idea. <laughs> and that's not gonna service us in any way, shape or form. But it serviced them this far running on the idea that uh, America is systemically racist and that if we convince everybody of their victimhood, they'll support us. And that has been what has happened thus far. In, in the wake of all the other issues that you could be focusing on right now, the lack of baby formula, kids being indoctrinated with racialized ideology, sexualized ideology in school, gas being exponentially higher than it should be, and people who work minimum wage jobs hurting their pockets by just commuting to work. You could talk about the uptick in crime. You could talk about the defund the police movement and how that has affected us. You could talk about inflation. You could talk about how it's difficult to buy a house in this current housing market for, for young people and older people alike. All these different things that you could talk about and acknowledge the problems that average Americans are experiencing and go, you know what? I wanna fix those things and let me, let me use my voice in order to do that. Beautiful, but no, racism, patriarchy, immigration, discrimination, the same, the same talking points time and time again to steer your eyes away from what is happening right in front of you in your own communities. And luckily, I think this is not going to work anymore, I hope. Uh, sometimes the condition that your community is in gets so bad that when politicians get in front of you and they just lie and try to pull the wool over your eyes, they can't because you're seeing and experiencing everything that's happening in this country on a daily basis. So just don't be fooled by anybody who wants to use the rhetoric of systemic racism in order to convince you uh, that you need to support what it is that they do. It's just unbelievable at this point and so condescending to people of color to be constantly told that no matter what you do, you are living in this environment. Unbelievable. Those are my thoughts on that ad. Let me know your thoughts down below. I just, the amount of people that had to have seen, seen that and approved it just blows my mind. Now we're going to get into some controversy uh, surrounding Elon Musk. He's back in the news again. Why? Because he told you if you're my employee, you have to go to the office. Spencer, isn't that so horrifying and scary? It's horrifying. It's horrifying. horrifying. Going back into the office? Can you imagine being around other people to do work and get paid for it? 
uh, imagine how many people have lost their jobs because of other reasons, but, you know, and then you just have to show up to the office and you're upset. <laughs> it's okay. unbelievable. So Elon Musk sent emails to his executive team and to all of his employees. I believe this second one is the one that he sent to everybody at Tesla. And the subject matter is to be super clear. <laughs> he wrote, everyone at Tesla is required to spend a minimum of 40 hours in the office per week. Moreover, the office must be where your actual colleagues are located, not some remote pseudo office. If you don't show up, we will assume you have resigned. The more senior you are, the more visible must be your presence. That is why I lived in the factory so much, so that those on the line could see me working alongside them. If I had not done that, Tesla would long ago have gone bankrupt. There are, of course, companies that don't require this. But when was the last time they shipped a new great product? It's been a while. Tesla has and will create and actually manufacture the most exciting and meaningful products of any company on earth. This will not happen by phoning it in. Thanks, Elon. Simple as that. Uh, and the internet went into an uproar about this, specifically Gen Z people, my generation that I am sometimes proud of, but more often than not, not proud of, uh, went back and forth with him, calling him a dictator at his company, saying that it's unbelievable uh, that he would ask people to be present in the office for 40 hours a week, that this should not be normalized, that it's not okay, that he's creating a harmful work environment, all because this email got sent out of him saying, hey, can you show up to work from nine to five, Monday through Friday, please? So I'm curious what your thoughts are. Has work life shifted in a way that we should not expect this from people? Because I can understand that during COVID, we shifted to this virtual workspace where people started working from home and doing that. And for some companies that went really well, and I imagine for others, it didn't go so well. But the companies uh, for which it went well, they're saying, okay, you can stay home and you don't have to come to the office. You don't have to come socialize with your coworkers. Is that a good thing? Is that something that we should be moving towards as a society? Is a 40-hour work week too long? Which is some of the conversations that we're having here in California. They're actually trying to pass legislation that makes uh, the, the work week shorter than 40 hours. I believe they want to make it like, what, 30, 35 or something? 32. 32 hours. And anything hours. over would be overtime. Anything over is overtime. To me, I hear that and I just think, wow, what a lazy group of people that they cannot show up to work, put in the hours, and, and do their jobs. That's what it says to me. I'm curious if it says something different to you. I can see other arguments where we look at our country and go, well, we've made so much progress with technology and innovation and all this stuff. And we were told that through progress with technology and innovation, it was going to make your life more leisurely. It was going to make your life easier. So is that same 40-hour work week leisurely or easier? Debatable. And we have to talk about where where technology and innovation plays a role in that. Should that shorten your work week? Or are we an innovative society that needs to constantly keep working in order to make progress, in order to succeed? It's a, it's a debatable thing. But what I've noticed more so than ever is Gen Z being disillusioned with the idea of going to work. I will go on TikTok or Instagram, YouTube, whatever, watch videos and all that fun stuff. And I see a lot of young 20 somethings saying it's absolutely ridiculous that somebody would expect them to show up in an office from nine to five to do work. And they say that it's actually endangering to them that they have to show up to the office and do work. And it blows my mind. And maybe it's because I have a really good work environment and the people at this office are great and I, I love to come and socialize. And Gen Z probably does not have that particular leaning when it comes to socialization and wanting to work with other people. But it blows my mind that this is a thing that people are saying and subscribing to. Now, I want to go through this article from Business Insider that talks about Gen Z and working and actually goes through some stats and some of the things that are being said. Uh, here's the headline. If you want to read the full article, meet the typical Gen Z worker who is quitting their job for a better one, but probably regretting it later. Uh, we'll, we'll see about the whole regret, regret thing. But they're saying that post pandemic has really altered the workforce and people's expectation of what it means to work. 
And I've heard this from employers who hop to the internet to show some of the responses that they're getting from Gen Z people who apply to their jobs, saying like, I want X amount of mental health days, X amount of physical health days. If I don't feel like coming into work one day and I wanna work from home, you should allow that for me. You should pay for this, this, and that. And you need to do this in order to make my workplace comfortable. And when I do come to work, I wanna be able to use my phone at any given time while I'm working in the office. And to me, it's just this air of entitlement that I'm hearing from Gen Z. And they're saying it's because they're anti-capitalists and they want to, uh, not be used for their labor. But last time I checked, being used for your labor looked a lot more like slavery. And you know that whole industrial revolution where we had like four-year-olds working in factories? That looks like exploitation of labor. Coming up and showing up to work and being paid what is a reasonable wage for the work that you do, not exactly exploitation. But Gen Z people are so susceptible for falling for the idea that it is exploitation. And I think it's a it's a mix of A, the prospect that maybe you wouldn't have to work 40 hours a week is really enticing. B, envious, a lot of envy when it comes to people who make more money than you, people who run companies rather than uh, working as employees at companies. But those people work to get where they get <laughs> often. And they, they've put in the hours, they put in the time, like Elon Musk, who when he created Tesla was constantly in the factory, either uh, you know overseeing what was happening or working with the employees himself to create the product that he envisioned. So this idea of not having to put in the work uh, in order to garner the, the proceeds and, and, and reap what you've sown is unbelievable to me. But here's th this article writes that Gen Z is demanding all of these things, all of the things that I mentioned, a uh, comfortable workspace, mental health days, all these physical health days and things like that, in a bold, in a new bold fashion, turning flexibility and well-being from workplace perks to workplace norms. Quote, the quest for a workplace that respects boundaries and needs is baked in generationally, says Lauren Stiller uh, Ricklein, the president of Ricklein Institute for Strategic Leadership. Now. What exactly qualifies as a workplace perk? I, I'm having trouble uh, coming to terms with exactly what that means. Working from home has never been really a, a workplace perk that you should expect to be a norm. I can understand maybe something like a mental health day and tack that on to your sick days. If you're feeling overwhelmed or you're experiencing burnout or you struggle with something uh, like a major depressive disorder, things like that. I could see days being allocated for you to take a break and sit back, which is why what a lot of people do. They take vacation days, they take their sick days, and they take time off of work. But it, this seems to be a more extreme form of demand when it comes from Gen Z. I, I want to scroll down to get to some of the ideas. Yeah, here's a quote here. I live in a society where my productivity matters more than my well-being, and so I'm just depressed and anxious all the time, says a Gen Z user. I'm smiling, but I'm deeply wounded. I work three jobs. Totally different case. Working three jobs is super extreme and still feel like I'm not doing enough. Should your productivity matter more than your well-being? Absolutely not. But again, we have to define what well-being means. <laughs> if you're like, I'm feeling kind of sad today. I don't want to come into work. I'm so sorry. I run a business uh, and I need people who are here to work and I need people who are here to push this business forward. Uh, so that's something that we always have to take into account and think about. And when we are developing and rearing what is a particularly sensitive new generation, what does a mental health day look like? Does it really look like I am at the pit and I'm in the pit of despair right now and I can't possibly come to work? Or does it look like I'm not feeling okay today, I would like a mental health day and if you don't allow that for me, you're a bigot. I have a feeling it's the latter. <laughs> I have a feeling with this particular generation, it is the latter. So much so that even people are getting on the internet on things like uh, Reddit and these discussion boards and talking about being completely anti-work and saying that you should not have to work. And we saw in the video that we reacted to yesterday, the Jubilee video, young people saying, well, if I just want to relax and take some time to myself, I shouldn't have an obligation to contribute to society. 
It's the biggest joke I've ever heard. It's the biggest joke. And they want to do that and they want to sit at home and relax and still expect the government or whatever entity that means that you pay for it to provide them with resources and facilitate them being able to not contribute to society. And what's happening now is that an unprecedented amount of Gen Z individuals are quitting their jobs. And we've seen this come to fruition as what has now been termed the great resignation, where millions of people left the workforce, either through uh, the COVID pandemic or through just being done with their jobs and not wanting to do them anymore, and then not re-entering the workforce. Why? Because for the past two years, we inflated unemployment checks and gave people all this stimulus and said, you want to sit at home and do nothing? In fact, we're going to make it illegal for some of you to even go and run your businesses. Here's money from the government to take care of it. And you can imagine how used to that uh, people would get and how quickly that would happen. I would love to just sit and do nothing all day and have the government provide me uh, with all of the money, the food, the resources that I need to just pursue whatever leisurely activity I would like. But is that the sign of a healthy society? No. And what does the government get when they give you all of that? A lot of power a lot of resources, a lot of surveillance. There's a lot of trade-offs when it comes to being completely beholden to your government. But Gen Z doesn't seem to have a problem with that idea. Now, let's scroll through a little bit more of this article before we move on. Yeah, it says here, one of the factors driving the quits or the rate of quitting is being forced to give up working from home. The typical Gen Zer is more inclined to quit over returning to the office full time. In a new report, the ADP Research Institute titled People at Work 2022 surveyed over 32,000 workers worldwide, found that 71 percent of 18 to 24 year olds said that if my employer insisted on me returning to the workplace full time, I would consider looking for another job. 71%. 71%. I'm curious for what that looks like for uh, other demographics, and maybe we'll do an episode on talking about nothing more than that. But 71% of people, 18 to 24, said if you ask me to come to the office 9 to 5, eh, I'm going to look for another job. Okay, I get it pursue your passions. I can see where somebody would be uh, misaligned with that idea, but that has been typical and normal for so long. And I'm so curious to see how businesses fare in the wake of a generation like this. Is this going to be something that ends up shifting the way that we view work in a positive light? Or is it going to be something that makes us regress and makes businesses fail? Because it's just crazy to me that somebody would not want to show up and just socialize with their fellow coworkers and and be at work. I can see the appeal to it. I totally understand. It's much better to just sit in your bubble all day and and uh, sit on your computer and do your work and all that. But oh my gosh, human interaction for a little while, being able to to bond with your colleagues over the shared work that you're doing, doing things that doing projects that either matter or don't matter, but having to experience that collectively with the people that you work with is an amazing thing. And we're finding increasingly that people in this younger generation have trouble communicating, like sharing eye contact with people, expressing their ideas. And what is working from home going to do to that reality? Is it going to make it better? Probably not. And is it more productive? Probably not. And I imagine these business owners are hurting because of the lack of productivity that can often be coupled with working from home. But those are just my thoughts. You guys let me know down below. We did do a survey, who's worse, Gen Z or millennials? I'm curious to see what you guys answer. 68% of you, it looks like, said Gen Z, while 32% said millennials. I, I don't often get into the realm of criticizing per particular generations uh, and, and trying to pit them against each other and say, well, one is good and one is bad. We all have our... our failings. Uh, and one generation leads to the other. So as much as we can sit and criticize certain generations, who created them? <laughs> and where did they come from? And where do the ideas that now shape the current culture come from? And why were they allowed to prosper? Because of the generations that came before us. So everybody has their burden to bear when it comes to the issues that we face. But there seems to be a particular issue for Gen Z not wanting to work 
uh, full time or even in an office at all. So let me know your thoughts on Elon Musk. Let me know your thoughts on this current generation and the workforce. And have you are any of you guys business owners that have found it really difficult to keep employees? I worked for a medical clinic before I started working at PragerU that has consistently found it so hard to find people who are willing to work and, and be consistent and show up on time and do what they need to do. And I imagine it's not a problem that they are experiencing in solitude. So let me know. Now we're going to move on to some climate news. You guys probably heard this. The Mona Lisa got attacked uh, by cake <laughs> with, uh, with a man who was wearing uh, a woman's wig, pretending to be an old woman, and I believe rolling around in a wheelchair in order to trick people of this disguise, only to go and deface the Mona Lisa in the name of what? Climate change. What exactly this speaks to, I don't know. I wish we had this man to come and explain exactly why he did this and what he was trying to communicate in defacing the Mona Lisa. Luckily, he was unsuccessful in actually ruining the piece of art. It does have a glass covering over that. Whether he was aware of that or not, I do not know. But in the comments below, let me know, do you think this is a successful form of protest? Do you think this really achieves pushing through the messages that you are trying to get across to people? I'm going to go as far as to say no, but we are now talking about this story because of how crazy it was. Is that conversation worth doing something that makes you look insane. <laughs> and I find with our all the issues that we talk about, climate change activists tend to be some of the most extreme or at least perform some of the most extreme forms of protest that we see. We are talking the sort of PETA, animal protection, climate change people who like throw blood on others and throw blood on themselves as a form of protest. They do the die-ins at different grocery stores and food chains and all this, all this weird stuff. You have the climate activists who are super gluing their hands and their bodies to chairs and tables and, and countertops at these different conferences. You had the guy, the guy from Secession, the TV show on HBO, who plays Uncle Ewan he super glued his hand to a Starbucks counter to talk about the current climate, to talk about the fact that they don't have vegan milks and that their vegan milks are in upcharge or whatever. It's just unbelievable to me what these green people <laughs> will do as a response to this. And what is funny about it is that much of our argument as it pertains to climate change, I'm not a climate change denier uh, by any means. However, I do question the urgency that people are placing on this issue in particular, and I question some of the rhetoric around how they go about solving these issues, specifically when we ignore massive, uh, massive avenues for change like nuclear power and things like that when it comes to climate change. So I question the motive. I question the sense of urgency and this idea of the earth is going to end in 12 years, as we heard from AOC, and this catastrophic communication of what you think to be an issue. Now, does a man dressing up as an old woman and getting in a wheelchair throwing cake at Mona Lisa make you look less insane? No. <laughs> No, I think it actually bolsters the people who say these climate change activists are absolutely loony. So I would maybe pick a form of protest that makes a little bit more sense. Maybe going outside a climate summit and talking about this or uh, protesting some of these uh, oil and gas companies, if that's your, if that's your uh, cup of tea. But it looks like oil and gas is not going to be a problem here in the United States because we are uh, not independent. We're completely dependent on other countries. So where you're going to protest here, I don't know. But you'll, you'll find a space uh, to do that. But it doesn't make you look less insane. So the fact that we're talking about it is fine. It's not going to really call attention to the issue. But here's what the ladies on The View had to say about this particular form of protest. We love The View, right, guys? 
understand how we're talking about that as opposed to the cause. So I think those kinds of stunts, like he wore a wig and he dressed up as, a, as an elderly woman in a wheelchair to smuggle it in. I, we're talking about that as She's opposed right. to what the issue is that he's actually protesting. So I think that stunts like that don't work at all. I it's think acid. they work. I, do too. I mean, we're talking about it. We're not yeah, talking, we're about, talking about, about climate change. It. We're talking yeah, about it. Yeah. But I, I, I think climate change is something that we, we ignore so much, in, not only in this country, but around the world. Um, and obviously, we're, we're talking about this issue. The Mona Lisa is about this big, I, I learned when I went to the Louvre. Yeah. And it also is in this, in this case. Yeah, it's but this it's, big, yeah, and it's somebody it's else's tiny, art. Yeah. But it's, but and it's, how dare you try to destroy yeah. but somebody you, else's art. I don't art. think it can be destroyed, because, well, again, it it's in now. this bullet, bulletproof thing. And he threw some it, whipped cream at it. Stand <laughs> wow, Whoopi coming in and saying something reasonable, like maybe don't destroy what is a centuries-old piece of art that is uh, beautiful and speaks to tradition and speaks to what we value as a culture. Wow. Claps for Whoopi Goldberg. I give her that one. But yeah, it's a first. That's a first. But Joy Behar, of course, comes in and says, well, I think it's effective. What has it been effective in? We're just talking about a random crazy man throwing cake at uh, a a centuries-old painting. That's what we're talking about now. And it makes you look even crazier. But of course, the view has to have those contentious moments. They have to go back and forth and they have to argue about these things. Before uh, we move on to our last story, I just want to ask you guys, please like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single day when we go live. That is 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And you guys have almost gotten us to, I think, 55,000 subscribers, which is amazing. We've grown so much just over the past seven days. Unbelievable. Thank you all so much for your support. Really do appreciate it. And I'm glad you're loving this new show. Now, let's talk. It's Pride Month, ladies and gentlemen. We kicked off Pride Month earlier this week. And now we have this image from the headquarters of Amazon in Seattle, where about 30 Amazon employees are staging a die-in. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with leftist speak and strategy and tactics, a die-in is where you stage a protest and pretend to be dead by just dead weight lying on the floor. And typically you don't speak. It's typically a silent protest. And people who want to get through or walk past you are forced to walk over your pseudo dead body. And the police who arrest you are forced to pick you up dead weight and carry you away in your pseudo dead state. Uh, so I don't imagine anybody was arrested at this particular protest. But 30 Amazon employees did this protest. Why? Because they are against the company's continued sale of what they deem to be transphobic books. And you might be asking yourself, transphobic book, what does that even mean? They're talking Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage, a book made by Matt Walsh called Johnny the Walrus, where a young boy says, I'm a walrus. And mommy and daddy go, absolutely. If you tell me you're a walrus, I think you're one. And let's take you to a doctor in order to uh, get your walrus surgery. So... These books have been deemed to be transphobic by the progressive left simply because they don't subscribe to the idea that young children, minors, can decide what their gender is uh, on a moment's notice and, and any whim that they have that they may not be the gender that they were born into. We don't want to exactly affirm that or jump heavy into the realm of maybe medical transitioning where we effectively sterilize our children with uh, puberty blockers and hormone replacement therapy and eventually sex reassignment surgery. All of these things seem pretty reasonable for me. Maybe we don't mutilate our children. Maybe we don't put them on puberty blockers. Maybe we don't put them on chemical drugs uh, that have been used for chemical castration of criminals and animals. Maybe we don't give our kids those drugs simply because they come home one day and say, mommy, I think I'm a boy. I think maybe we have deeper discussions about what is underlying in, in that particular issue. Maybe we go to therapy <laughs> and talk about how girls and boys can express themselves very differently and some boys are feminine and some girls are masculine and that's totally okay. Maybe that is a healthier response to that than the opposite, going through medical transition. But no, these 30 Amazon employees couldn't have that be the case. They call the books transphobic and they stage their die-in. And if they're Gen Z, probably on company time they did this. <laughs> oh, I can't. You can't make this stuff up anymore. You really can't. And on our last piece of news, I wanted to get into something good that has happened. Our boy, Ron DeSantis, uh, is coming after 
the ability for minors to medically transition. This is NBC News. Governor DeSantis administration asks state medical board to ban transition related care for minors and Medicaid recipients. The two pronged effort ensures DeSantis can act quickly and without need for legislative approval. Now, this is wonderful. I think this is amazing. Of course, I think as a society, as a nation at large, we should decide that allowing children to medically transition is not a good idea whatsoever. And maybe even go as far as to say that teaching gender ideology in schools is not good whatsoever. Two steps that Florida as a state has now taken. And I love to see it. I love to see a state set the stage for how the entire nation should act. And that's what Florida has been doing in nearly every endeavor that it takes on. It is setting the stage for what other states should be doing and what your elected representative should be doing. And that's something to think about because so many people on both sides of the aisle just tell you, this is a problem, I'm gonna fix it. This is a problem, I'm gonna fix it. This is a problem, I'm gonna fix it. And they do nothing. So isn't it nice to see somebody who's actually fixing things and in doing something about the issues that you hold near and dear to your heart and that are affecting your children? And a lot of people are gonna see this and I imagine some progressives are gonna see this and go, this is monstrous, this is dictatorial, this is absolutely horrible, and we have never seen this happen in human history. Except we have. And if you look and do research into transgenderism as it pertains to minors and this idea that we should just allow them to transition, other nations have taken on this headfirst, have done the research and have decided, no, this is not a good idea for us. Sweden banned this form of medical care for minors. Finland has done studies and come out, uh, their medical societies have said there is no improvement in minors' mental, physical health once you put them on puberty blockers and hormone replacement therapy and give them the sex reassignment surgery. And they've come out with medical reports saying, no, 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 we should not do that. The UK, done studies on it, found no sign of improvement. France also has done studies, found no sign of improvement, and actually did a whole uh, medical write-up about how social media has been a massive influence in just social contagion of gender confusion, particularly among young minors, and went as far as to say that if your minor expresses gender confusion, you should wait as long as is humanly possible and go down every other avenue that you possibly can before ever considering medically transitioning your child. So if, others, if other nations can do it, why, why can we not? Why are we behind in talking about this? Why have we allowed what is a small subset of individuals who just happen to be particularly loud and flamboyant about what they believe dictate what it is that we do to protect our children? We should not allow that. And I hope this sets the stage for other states coming forth and going, nope, not gonna allow that. In fact, we're gonna protect kids. And we're not gonna let their brains be infiltrated with this nonsense that is harming them in ways that are measurable and immeasurable. There are ways that we will never know how people have been harmed by this ideology and allowing it to take place. I mean, we're talking suicide, attempted suicide, depression and anxiety, parents having their kids taken away from them, kids just generally not feeling a sense of comfort in their body, and then going through this entire process only to realize that it didn't fix the problem. It didn't fix the issue. So if you care about trans people, if you care about actual trans lives and people who are experiencing this uh, gender dysphoria, uh, in, in the depths of, of their mind, body, and soul, you should care about finding the proper form of treatment. And medical transition is not it, despite what others may tell you. So big win in the state of Florida. Hope to see it travel to other places soon. Let me know as we end the stream for today in the comments after we're done, what was the most interesting story that we talked about? And do you have thoughts on Gen Z in the workplace? Are you experiencing that? Do you guys have kids who are Gen Z or are you Gen Z right now listening to this and you have problems with the workforce or your kid does? Do you echo the sentiments that some young people have around working this 40 hour work week in the office or do you say, no, get your butt to work and, and work like, like we did? And, and actually work way less than we ever did because the generations prior to us have done a lot more work and put in a lot more of the groundwork than we will ever have to do in the future. And we are lucky to live in the, in the nation that we live in today and in the reality that we live in today. Let me know in the comments below. That's our show for today. Happy, happy Friday. Hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Again, like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single day when we go live. Three, 
Pacific, 6 Eastern. And if you'd like to listen to us, go to Google Play, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review to let me know that you love the show, or leave us a one-star review if you hate it. I will take that as well. Uh, engagement is engagement. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much for subscribing at the rate that you've been subscribing and for listening to all the things that we have to say. Hopefully we have a good discussion in the comments, and I'll see you guys on Monday.